Hello and welcome to this webinar on the Common Reporting Standard for Charities. My name is Ewan Morrison and I head up the charity team at Chain and Tate. In the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to explain what the Common Reporting Standard is, set out the circumstances where it might apply to charities, and if it does apply, I'll explain what the implications are. The Common Reporting Standard was set up by countries around the world who were coming together just to agree on a way to improve on tax transparency. And this is an international standard from the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. So it's all about the exchange of tax information with the various countries involved. And it's about getting information from financial institutions, which is where it's targeted. And I'll explain later on what a financial institution is. Generally, it's to target the abuse of the, the ability to hold assets and gain income from assets held in offshore tax jurisdictions. And um, obviously, that's something that's quite topical in the media currently. Now, you may have heard of the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, or FATCA. This is a, a USA regulation, which is in many ways similar to the Common Reporting Standard, and but it enables United States tax authorities to get information about US tax assets or investments overseas. It is a separate bit of regulation and it certainly is not the same as the Common Reporting Standard. And one key distinction between FATCA and CRS is that for FATCA, charities are actually exempt, but under CRS, unfortunately, charities are included. So, to become a financial institution, there are two key condi conditions that you need to meet. And the first of these is that more than 50% of your total income has to be derived from investments. So, in this context, we need to ask, what do we actually mean by income from investments? Well, you'll see on the left-hand side of your screen a number of investments which are generally of the type that we would traditionally associate with, with this source of income. So we have shares, securities, derivatives, and perhaps insurance contracts. Of course, a charity may have other forms of investment, and some of these might be, for instance, investment property. You might have rental income from a building that you let out. You may have surplus cash that you put on deposit and get interest from. You might have a trading subsidiary that gift aids its profits up. That's another form of investment. And more commonly, we're also now seeing social investments held by charities. Well, for all these investments on the right-hand side of the slide, for the purposes of the common reporting standard, these aren't regarded as investments. So any income from these, you can disregard for the purpose of the calculations. And on the how we calculate the investment income, the first thing to be aware of is that we're actually looking at the calendar year. So we're not considering the income within the charity's financial reporting year or the fiscal tax year. It's actually from the January to December period that we need to look at. And we carry out our calculations on a cumulative basis. So what you're doing is looking at your total income versus your investment income over a three-year period and this is up to the end of the year before the year that we're actually reporting on. So just as an example, at the moment we'd be looking at having to report on the year to the end of December 16. So when we're looking at our cumulative calculations, we're actually looking at the three years up to December 15. Now you may of course be quite a new or a young charity, and in that case you're just looking at the shorter period from where the charity has been in existence. The next condition that you'd have to, to meet to become a financial institution, it all relates to how your investments are managed. And it applies if your investments are subject to discretionary management. And again, there is a bit more detail as to what that actually means. The majority of investments that are likely to be caught by the Common Reporting Standard will probably have investment managers who 
people will be appointed to look after the portfolio. And the level of discretion that they may have will depend on who's buying, on who's making the decisions about buying or selling the shares or the investments within that portfolio. If this is all within the, the power or the control of the actual investment managers, that would be deemed to be discretionary. If, however, it's the trustees who are actually making the decisions on buying and selling, albeit they might be acting on the recommendations or the advice of the investment managers, if it's the trustees making the decisions, then that would be deemed to be non-discretionary management and therefore wouldn't apply. Now, investment managers will, of course, often be working within parameters and to particular investment policies. So they might have targets, of course, to, to apply when they're investing um, the portfolio. They might be operating within certain sectors. And of course, they'll probably also have some form of ethical investment policy, such as not investing in arms or perhaps fossil fuels. In this case, while there are certain restrictions on the management of the investments, there, because there is still discretion within those boundaries, but that is still deemed to be discretionary management for the purposes of these rules. So if we have um, met both of these conditions about the 50% of the income test and the discretionary management, we then have to go into this process where we carry out checking, which is called due diligence. We carry this out on certain people or organisations that are known as account holders under these rules. And the due diligence process is really about collecting information on the account holders um, at the initial stage. So you might ask, what exactly is an account holder? Well, it's termed uh, as someone who has a debt or an equity interest in the charity. But this does depend on the type of charity you are and what your constitution is. In the case of trusts and unincorporated associations, there are three categories that uh, would be deemed to be account holders. The first of these are beneficiaries, and these would be people you give donations to or grants to, fairly straightforward. The next category are settlers, and, and these are people providing, giving donations to the charity, but with quite specific instructions, such as having to use the funds to buy services or apply them to particular suppliers. So it doesn't appear that these are just what might be normal restricted donations, but instead very restricted or, or very specific um, instructions as to how those, those funds should be applied. The final category, and this is where we're looking at a debtor to interest in the charity, and this is where you have loans made to the charity. So someone making a loan to a charity in this case would be deemed to be an account holder. Now, out of those three, it would be the beneficiaries that would be the most likely account holder that you would see. And certainly, if you had a large investment portfolio, you're probably less likely to be looking for external loan finance. The other form of constitution for charities, which is the incorporated, incorporated form, and this is obviously companies, those incorporated by Royal Charter or Scottish Charitable Incorporated Organisations, in terms of the equity interest in the charity, what we're looking at would be shareholders. But in the case of companies limited by guarantee or incorporated by Royal Charter, we have members rather than shareholders. And the rules specifically exclude members from being deemed to have an equity interest in the charity. So if you're those types of charity, then the, that won't apply. The other form of um, account holder as with the trusts and the unincorporated associations, will also be in the case that you have a loan made to the charity. So the big difference then between the two forms of charity is that you wouldn't, an account holder wouldn't be deemed to be someone who is a beneficiary in the case of an incorporated charity. So just looking at a bit more detail at beneficiaries, HMRC in its rules sets out two different types of beneficiary. The first of these is a direct beneficiary, and this is obviously someone who's um, receiving grants or donations. 
But in the case where you have some form of intermediary, i.e. Part of the cash that's being paid out as a grant or donation is going to a party or an individual or an, an individual to be paid out to other parties, then you may have indirect beneficiaries in that case. And this is generally where you have some form or where the recipient of the cash of the grant is, is carrying out some form of administrative task and passing it on to the end beneficiary. So where the intermediary doesn't really have a degree of control or discretion over the application of those funds, then it could be that the actual account holder is the end recipient of those funds. These rules can be a bit difficult to interpret and the HMRC manual does provide a few examples of what we should be looking at in that case. Another thing to highlight at that stage is just the timing of the amounts paid to the beneficiaries or the account holders. And what we're looking at when we're considering what is, what is paid out in the relevant periods, we're looking at amounts um, paid out on the cash basis. So we're not looking at necessarily what's been accrued unless we have a grant agreement where we are paying future instalments. So in general, you'll be reporting grants in the period that they were paid. But if under the terms of a grant award agreement, you have additional future instalments to pay, then you will be including those also in the reporting period that you paid the first amount. So looking at our procedure, we, we know we have to collect various information on the account holders. And the key thing that we have to do next is to establish the tax residence of those account holders. And the way that we need to do this is through what's called self-certification, where what we're doing is we're asking the account holders to provide us with various information and certain things that are required to be reported. Now, this is something that's required for all account holders, with one exception, which I'll mention shortly. And there's various types of information, which is generally what we would be reporting to HMRC. And this is the information that we need to gather through this process. To get this information, we can use different ways to do There are different ways to do this, but we can use a tick box um, procedure on forms. You could gather the information electronically or verbally, provided it's properly documented. And it would be a good idea to build this into your existing grant application process just to avoid duplication of work. Now for this self-certification process, I mentioned there is one exception to the element where you're asking people to self-certify their tax residence. And that applies in the case of registered UK charities. So if you are on the charity register maintained by OSCAR, the Charity Commission in England and Wales, or the Charity Commission for Northern Ireland, if you're on any of those registers, then you don't need the tax residence to be self-certified. But you do, of course, need to collect the various elements of information just to ensure that you have this. And with this overall self-certification, you are asked to carry out what's called a reasonableness, reasonableness test. And you should be check, carrying out basic checks on perhaps other information that you hold and build that into your application process. Now, if there's no reason to believe the information you, you've been provided with is incorrect, then it is um, acceptable just, just to take that as it is. So we've, in terms of our collection of information, um, we've established the tax residence of the person that we're giving grants to, the person that, we're, um, that are deemed to be account holders. We have the self-certification process um, subject to us checking as whether, there's, whether they're a UK charity or not. And the next stage in the process is to see whether, looking at the tax residence, to see whether that account holder is in a reportable jurisdiction. Now, reportable jurisdiction is a, includes a number of countries around the world. And for reporting on the 26th period, 
there's a list of countries which is on the HMRC's website. You can see on this list that includes most of Europe, um, includes Scandinavian countries, but also other countries around the world. And certainly as more countries come into this, um, into this scheme, into this, this programme, you'll see more having to be reported on in future years. Now you might notice that there are a couple of countries not on that list. The first, of course, is the UK, because we're only looking here at reporting on countries based in overseas jurisdictions. So that's why we're, we're not interested here in UK charities. The other country that's not here is the United States. And as I explained earlier on in the webinar, the US has its own regime of FATCA. So the FATCA is not part of CRS. And if you have charities that whose tax jurisdiction, tax residence is in the United States, then they wouldn't be deemed to be in a reportable jurisdiction under these rules. The final step in the process, having checked whether the account holder is in a reportable jurisdiction, is that we actually have to report them to HMRC. Now, there is, a, as part of this, if we are reporting somebody to HMRC, then we do need to notify them. And there's a, a deadline for doing that, which we'll mention shortly. But um, we're having to report people. And in terms of the actual information that we have to report, there is a, a list within the manual. The first few elements of these are fairly straightforward, such as name and address. Point four in the list is that where there is some form of tax identification number, we need to include that in what will be reported. Clearly, we have to know the tax residence, the jurisdiction where that information will ultimately be reported. And where the account holder is an entity, we have to note what type of entity it is. And there are three categories here that we're looking at. The first is financial institution, and we've talked about the definition of that earlier on. The next one is an active non-financial entity. And this would be an entity where less than 50% of your total income derives from investments. And the final um, entity that we might um, have as a status would be a passive non-financial entity. And this is one where more than 50% of your income derives from investments, but where you have non-discretionary management. Another thing that we are asked to do and report on um, is that we should be assigning, or charities should be assigning a reference number to each of their account holders, and that should be noted on the reportable information. And that will just help HMRC track them during this reporting process. You do, of course, have to know the actual name of the charity making the report. And finally, we have to note the account balance um, in the case where you may have a loan, or the value of the actual donation or grant made in the calendar year. The way that we actually submit the returns is through an online portal. And this is through the government gateway, and it is something you would need to register for. And it is in many ways similar to the gift aid, um, registering for that and reporting on that. And to get the information up there, there is an upload schema, or Excel sheets. And if you have a small number of reportable account holders, then there is a form for manual entry. So just talking briefly about deadlines, in terms of carrying out the due diligence, this is something you really should be during, carry out during the reporting period, so during the year to the end of December. And then you should be confirming who would be an account holder that you should be reporting reporting on, so you're looking at who the reportable persons are. I mentioned previously that if you are reporting somebody, then you have to notify them that they are being reported to HMRC. And you actually need to do this by the 31st of January, following the period end. Now, as, as you can see, we're already past this particular deadline. So if you are going to have to report somebody for the 16 year, then you certainly should be advising them as soon as possible. And the final deadline that we have is actually making the report HMRC themselves. And the deadline for that is the 31st of May following the period end. 
and of course we don't have very long to meet that deadline and it is important that if you haven't considered CRS you certainly act very quickly. Now HMRC have only very recently revised or updated their guidance for charities in respect to common reporting standards and in recognition of that they have said that they would apply a soft landing approach to dealing with compliance. So where you have sort of minor administrative er errors they are not likely to be penalizing these but of course if there are deliberate misstatements of information then HMRC are obviously not going to be too happy with that. Now, of course, you've been through this process and you've confirmed that you don't have any account holders that you need to report, then you don't have to submit a nil return. If you don't have to submit a return, then you don't even have to register with the HMRC under, this, under these rules. But if, if, of course, you think that you may have to do so in the future, then it may be worth registering just so you're prepared for future reporting. Now, these rules aren't straightforward, but there are a couple of very useful resources that we can look at to get more information. The first of these is provided by the Association of Charitable Foundations, and they have been liaising with HMRC during the development of these rules, and they have some excellent information on their website. And this includes a recent briefing um, carried out on, on the, the new rules and that includes questions and answers that various people have. It includes a checklist for charities that think this might apply to them and it also includes some example forms so there's some very good guidance to look at there. The other key resource is the actual HMRC manual HMRC rules themselves and while some of this can be complex where it is useful is where you're looking at examples of when you may have discretionary or non-discretionary investment management. And the other examples provided are where you may have direct or indirect beneficiaries. So in particular for both of those cases, that guidance from HMRC is very helpful. So just to summarize our actions from the Common Reporting Standard, First thing is to check if you are indeed a financial institution and if you are then you need to be carrying out this due diligence on your account holders which in most cases is going to be your beneficiaries. You certainly need to keep records of this process and, and your documentation and if you do confirm that you have people to report then make sure you report to HMRC within the deadlines that are in place. Now that really brings to the end the actual webinar itself. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in which might be useful just, just to cover. Um, I'm looking down some of the ones that we have. The first one that we've got is just a question about whether there is a de minimis limit for the level of grants made and unfortunately there isn't. So any, any beneficiaries or any grants made to beneficiaries whatever the level could potentially be reportable. The next one that we have is about looking at how we're calculating our income levels and where we don't have a, a year that's coterminous with the, the reporting year to the end of December. So if you've got a March um, financial reporting year end, for instance, how do you actually allocate your income into the calendar year period? Well, the guidance doesn't actually make this terribly clear, but it does seem reasonable that you would do this just on a pro rata basis. One of the, uh, another query we have here is in relation to investment income and looking at this 50% test, um, someone's just saying that, well, my investment income, it may be over 50% in one year, but the next year, looking at this test on a cumulative basis, it might fall out of that. Well, that, that is actually the case, um, that that can occur. And I think HMRC is expecting that that may happen. So you certainly charities may find that they are coming in and out of these reporting regulations and um, that is something that, that we may, may well see. There is um, there's a query here about due diligence procedures and I think this is in the case where, yeah, this is the case where you 
maybe making uh, multiple grants to the same beneficiary. And the question is whether you have to carry out due diligence procedures every time you make a grant to the same particular beneficiary or account holder. Well, in general, you don't, once you carry out the due diligence process, you wouldn't have to repeat that unless you think the circumstances have changed. But I think you, you certainly should be looking at your account holders each year and considering if you think that their status might have changed. And if, of course, it has, then you will need to document that and consider your reporting accordingly. Now, we've got um, just one final question, I think, that we'll cover. And um, this is somebody asking about a what's called a legal entity identifier number or an LEI number. And um, this, an LEI number is not actually something that's to do, that actually relates to the common reporting standard. This is uh, an identification code that um, investment managers may need charities to, to um, apply for and provide them with in order that they can process financial transactions on their behalf. And I think we've had one or two of our charity clients um, being asked for this. And this is something that may need to be in place from the start of 2018 in order for investment managers to, to try and carry out transactions. So certainly if your investment manager hasn't spoken to you about an LEI already, then it is something that you, you perhaps might want to be discussing with them. Um, as I said, this is not something that's directly related to, um, or is not in fact related to the common reporting standard. Well, that, um, I think those are probably the, the end of the questions that we have on the webinar. And of course, if you have any others, then please don't get in, don't hesitate to get in touch with the team and their, their names are at Chainity are listed on the slide there. So thank you very much for listening to the webinar and I hope that's been helpful in explaining a bit more about the common reporting standard. Clearly, there is some work to do and um, plenty of things to consider as to whether it applies to you and um, what you have to do to comply. Um, but um, as I said, the, hopefully that has been helpful. Just as a final note, uh, at Chain and Tea, we are currently preparing for our summer series of charity seminars um, and we'll be certainly providing you with more information and update on these on due course. So thank you for listening and goodbye.